Hi guys, today we're going to do a black and white video. We're going to continue the Maru of Winter Caves read aloud. Before we continue, I would like you to grab a paper and pencil so you're going to take notes when I ask you some questions, okay? You can pause the vi this video and go there to get uh, the paper and pencil. So last time we were reading we got to a, a part where they were getting very far from um, the other group and then they were getting a little worried because they were far from the other group of hunters and it was starting to get cold and winter would come soon so let's continue the great plain seemed endless and there were utterly alone, except for the deer and the creatures that hunted them. The moon had been newborn when they left the cliff where Arag died. And it was new again when the first snow came. So now it was snowing. The night before, there had been no sign of the moon nor of any stars. All afternoon the sky had been heavy with unshed snow. They camped at Old Mother's insistence in a sheltered space between some large boulders using deer skins as roof cover. When Maru looked out in the morning, it was to a white world. Everything was white. The sun, swollen to monstrous size, had turned red and hung low in the sky. Its light made the snow crystals glitter with specks of rainbow color. Maru felt the firm surface of the snow with her finger. She pressed, and it crumbled downward. The snow near the entrance was pure with not a dent upon it except Maru's fingerprint, but only a spare throw away it had been trampled by a trail of hoofs. The deer were passing slowly, searching for food. Maru saw one animal stop and paw at the snow until it had clear, cleared a grassy patch where it began foraging for mushrooms. The deer's coat looked dark against the blinding snow. Its warm breath hung on the icy air in a cloud. The snow was not deep, but later that day it snowed again, driving them to seek shelter early. Nimai cried. She hated the snow in her face so Maru had to carry her. They saw the dog pack again, a little way ahead of them, nipping and worrying at the deer, this time without success. Next morning, it was still snowing, and they stayed late in their shelter until it stopped. By the following day, the snow was thawing and the ground was wet and slushy showing big patches of green. That was the day Maru saw the tarn, tarn again. The birds were up on the slope above the overhang where the family was camped, pecking at leaves and berries among the short grass. A few were still flecked with their gray autumn plumage, but others were almost completely white. Maru signaled to attack. He came with his sling and crept cautiously toward the flock. Maru watched him. If a rag had been alive or if Vorka had been uninjured, she thought, there might have been three or four birds roasting over the fire tonight. But at least there was a chance of one. So now I would like you to pause and try to guess. What do you think? Do you think they will be able to get to a bird? Otax's sling was made of a forked antler time and 
a strip of well-chewed stretchy hide. He fitted a pebble into the hide, drew it slowly back and let go. The stone sank. The birds erupted into flight, loud, clapping winged beats, taking them rapidly aloft. The air was full of their crackling cries. Otak leaped and waved the sling. One bird was down. So now I would like you to write down that they were able to get one bird. And I would like you to describe how Otak was able to get this bird. Okay? How was he able to get this bird? Maru climbed up to the grassy ledge. The bird lay stunned. It was a male, pure white, except for his scarlet eyebrow feathers and a black border around his tail. Otak killed the bird with a stone and carried it proudly to the hearth place. The two women and Borka praised him. Maru plucked the bird, saving the feathers. The larger ones might decorate a head uh, a, a headdress, and the soft ones would make the stuffing for a doll for Nimai. Old Mother good gutted the ptarmigan, stuffed it with nuts and mushrooms, and wrapped it in leaves to roast in the fire. It was little enough to share among all of them that evening, but welcome. They took off their sodden boots sodden boots and dried them around the fire. Otak's feet were painfully cold and old mother found that one of his toes was almost frozen. She shaved it back to life, tut tutting at him for not having complained before. A little longer and you would have lost that toe and before long your foot she said, and told them all a, ca a cautionary tale of a boy who had walked until his feet were frozen and had died as a result. Otak and Maru exchanged a glance and smiled behind her back. They had heard all old mother's warning many times. So now I would like you to pause this video and write down what happened to Otak's feet and also um, the story of this little boy that old mother said, okay, write it down, describe how his feet were and why, and also write down this story that old mother just told them. Before they reached the white mountain, the first blizzard came. Old mother predicted it the night before when they heard the wind screaming past their shelter and felt the icy sting of the air. She and the cat went out after dark and laid extra stones around the edges of the skin covering and tied down loose flapping ends. All night the shelter tugged and strained at its anchorages as if it longed to join the wild racing of the wind. By morning, the blizzard had begun. The blizzard had begun. The wind shrieked, drowning their voices as they struggled to dismantle, dismantle the shelter. Tikak had wanted to stay, but old mother refused. They must keep moving, she said. The blizzards would only get worse. There was an outcrop of rock half a day half a day's walk away and old mother planned to bring them to it by nightfall maru knew the place it was large enough to provide shelter from the wind but a tiny landmark in the vastness of the plain how would they ever find it in the blizzard we may not find it old mother admitted but we will try the rocks were the west. There was no sun, nothing to guide them except a natural sense of direction. What do you think, guys? Do you think they will be able to find this shelter or no? Let's keep reading to see. Old Mother's instinct was particularly sure. 
she led the way. That day was the longest Maru had ever endured. Hour after hour they struggled slowly with the bitter snow-laden wind stinging their faces and slicing through their heavy clothes. Maru, her back and arms aching from carrying Nimai, was scarcely conscious of anything but the need to go on, one foot after another, over and over again until they stopped in numb weariness. There was no sheltered place to light a fire. So they ate cold dried meat and drank melted snow. Hunger was their only guide to the passage of time. Maru did not know how long they had been walking when she put Nimai down to rest her arms and asked Old Mother if they could have missed the rocks. Old Mother had stopped too to concentrate on renewing her sense of direction and time. I think we're near the place, she said. She took off her backpack and gave it to Maru. You take this for a while, she said. I will carry Nimai. Maru gratefully took up the less awkward weight of the pack. The family drew together again with old mother in the lead and Vorka at the rear. Maru and Otak were in the middle. Rivo trotted beside Otak. Maru, squinting through half-closed eyes, saw nothing but whirling snowflakes. But before they had gone much farther, she heard a shout from old mother. I see the rocks! A few steps on and Maru saw them too. The shape was familiar to her, for she had often camped by these rocks before, but never in such bad weather. So now I wanted to pause and write down that yes, they did find the, the rocks. And the place was simply a pile of large boulders standing the height of two men, with a few wind cropped trees growing nearby. So now I want you to describe this place. Okay, write down what I just said, the way that I described. You can pause this video. The family walked around the rocks until they reached the sheltered side. At once, the battering of snow and wind was cut off. The relief was enormous. Maru, slipping the pack from her shoulders, felt that she could not have walked another step. There was a large crevice between two of the boulders, which would serve as a shelter for the night, but the wedge of the sky, the wedge of sky showed at the top. The space would have to be roofed with skins. Otak and Maru climbed up the rocks and stretched a hide across the gap, waiting weighting it down with stones that Tikek and Old Mother found and passed up to them. The wind was so fierce on top of the rocks that they were almost blown off, and the hide kept flapping black, 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 back over their faces, but at last they got the stones in place. With the roof made, everyone crowded into the small space and old mother unrolled another hide and put it over them to serve as a makeshift doorway. It was a cold, com comfortless shelter without fire or space to move. All night they sat huddled together for warmth. No one slept much except the baby and Rivo. So now I would like you to pause this video and describe the shelter, how uncomfortable it was and why. Toward morning, Maru dozed off, wedged between Otak and Old Mother. She woke cold and stiff to find that part of the roof cover that blown away, had blown away and her jacket was encrusted with snow. Looking up, she saw that it was day. The snowstorm still raged, as savage as ever. To her shame, she felt herself beginning to cry. 
I can't bear another day like yesterday, she sobbed as old mother began sharing out the dried meat, giving a piece to everyone, even the dog. If today is like yesterday, old mother said, we will have to stop and build a snow house until the blizzard is over. She looked around at the circle of cold, pinched faces, red-eyed from lack of sleep. But if we can find the strength, we should walk for one more day. Maru sniffed. <laughs> Why can't we build a snow house now? Listen, old mother said kindly, patting her shoulder. If we stop, we may never move again. We have hardly any food left. We can't hunt in the storm. Once we stop, our only hope will be that the storms will end before we starve to death. I want to bring us as far as possible on our way before we give in to the blizzard. Do you understand now? Maru wiped her face with her gloved hand. Yes, she said humbly. The family were ready to go. Tikak tucked the baby snugly inside her jacket and took up her bundle. Vorka and Atak lifted their loads. Maru hoisted Nimai onto, their, onto her shoulders and stepped out into the tearing wind. That day, the sky never lightened and the thick, flurring snowflakes never ceased to fall. It was worse than the day before. They were hungrier, less hopeful and exhausted from lack of sleep. Maru had lost all sense of direction. She stumbled on, head bent against the knife edge wind. Following the small hunched shape of her grandmother trudging trud ahead. They stopped once to melt snow under their jackets and drink it, chew a small piece of meat each, stamp their frozen feet, and brush the snow from the wolverine fur that flamed their faces. Old mother brushed the snow from her hood. She was so cold that her jaw had gone rigid, and at first she could not speak. She took off a mitten and rubbed her face until the muscles relaxed. Then she said what they all expected. We must stop now until we must stop now and build a snow house and wait until the blizzard is over. And then we are going to start chapter 10. So now I would like you to write down what do you think? Do you think they will make it? Do you think they will survive? And what's the most difficult thing that they would face, in your opinion? Starvation, perhaps hunger, starvation, or the cold? What do you think?